The Manchester Man by Mrs. George Linnaeus Banks Chapter 20 Action and Reaction The August sun had looked down in its noontide splendour when the events I have attempted to describe took place, but the tide of terror and destruction swept beyond the limits I have covered, and, after the fierce onslaught, as if the carnage had been insufficient, artillery went rattling and thundering through the streets to all the peaceful and terrified inhabitants, as the flying crowd dispersing left bare St. Peter's Field, pressing outward and onwards through all accessible ramifications, the main thoroughfares thinned, and the scene of action took a wider radius. Still the gallant hussars and yeomanry went prancing through these thoroughfares, dashing hither and thither, slashing at stragglers, shouting to the rebels, and to each other, to clear the way, driving curious and anxious spectators from doors and windows, and firing at refractory outstretched heads. To clear the streets more effectually, cannon were planted at the entrances of the leading outlets from the town, and, as if that were not enough, the artillery had orders to fire. At New Cross, two of these guns, which went rattling up Oldham Street to the dismay of Augusta and the Chadwicks, as well as their neighbours, were posted, one with its hard iron mouth directed up Newton Lane, the other set to sweep Ancoats Lane, not then so wide as at present. It is now, of course, called Great Ancoats Street. Nathaniel Bradshaw's butcher's shop was situated at the narrowest part of Ancoats Lane, a little beyond the canal bridge. The shutters had been closed precipitately on the first alarm, but Martha Bradshaw and her younger brother Matthew opened the window of the room above, and had their heads stretched out to watch and question the white-faced people scurrying past in disorder. When Matt Cooper, who lived with his genial son-in-law, came hurriedly home for dinner, his route from the tannery lay in a straight line up Miller's Lane, past Shudo Pits and the New Cross, into Ancoats Lane, where he crossed only just before the cannon lumbered up. His clogs had rattled as swiftly over the pavement as his stiffening, hidebound long legs would carry them, and observing the heads of Martha and Matthew advance from the window, he waved his hand in gesticulation for them to withdraw from a post so fraught with peril. But youth is willful, and woman curious. They either did not understand or did not heed his warning. They did not know all he had seen at New Cross, or how narrow an escape he had had from Aspinall's flashing sabre. Do go in, childer, he cried as he drew near, if you want him to keep the yeds on your shoulders, wenches and lads shouldn't have look on such sights. And you seen that? the wife asked anxiously. No. He's gone to see what a mob and feeding's about. I wish he were home. Matt wished the same, but went in at the unfastened door and passed on to the room beyond, where he found the untended lobscouse boiling over into the fire. He took the lid off the pot, then went to the stair foot and called, Martha! There being no answer, he strolled back through the shop, saying as he went, Dang it! Who'll not be content to lose hurt? He stepped out on the rough pavement and looked up, called out, Do put your heads in, you'll... A musket shot, splintering a corner of the stone window sill on which they leaned, was more effective than his adjuration. The cannon boomed simultaneously. A shriek recalled the hastily withdrawn heads, and there, on the rough, sun-baked ground before their eyes, lay, weltering in blood, a doubled-up form, which a minute before had been their father, Matt Cooper, the tanner, the preserver of Jabus, the friend of Simon and Bess. This harrowing event was the last of the painful incidents of that fatal day coming within the scope of this history, which, isolated as they are, the writer knows to be true, even though they may not be chronicled elsewhere. The streets grew silent and deserted, save by the military and medical men, as the day and the night advanced, but within the houses of poor and rich there were loud complaints and groans and murmurings which did not sink to silence with the day that called them forth. 
The town was, as it were, in a state of siege, and men of business, whether Tories or radicals alike, felt the stoppage of trade and commerce in their pockets, whether they felt the cruelty and injustice to the injured in their hearts or not. But chiefly those who had friends wounded by design or accident in the melee were loud in their denunciation of the whole proceedings, and of these neither Mr. Chadwick nor Mr. Ashton was the least prominent, even though the one was paralysed, and they were of contrary shades of politics, the former being what he himself called a staunch and true out-and-out Tory, the latter having a leaning towards liberal, not to say radical opinions, and at county elections voting with the Whigs. The stiff church and king man, whose sons had distinguished themselves in the army and navy, and whose son-in-law Wormsley might also be said to have distinguished himself in the loyal Manchester yeomanry. He, who had been a member of John Shaw's club in the marketplace, and called for his Peoris cue bowl of punch, even before the aroma of Jacobitism ceased to flavour the delectable compound, and while yet John Shaw himself lived to draw his silver spoon from its particular pocket to concoct the same, and, inexorable autocrat that he was, could crack his whip in his pokey bar parlour in the ears of even noble customers who lingered after his imperative eight o'clock, gentlemen, eight o'clock, or summon his sturdy factotum, Molly, with mop and pail, to drive thence with wetted feet those whom the whip had failed to influence. He, who had stuck to the club even after John Shaw, Molly, and the punch-house itself had gone to the dust. He, Charles Chadwick, whose Toryism had grown with his growth, was foremost in condemning the proceedings of Peter Lou. In his own person he had witnessed how the actual breakers of the peace were those commissioned to preserve it. In the wanton attack on himself, an unarmed, defenceless, disabled old man, he recognised the general characteristics of the whole affair, and entered his protest against so lawless an exposition of the law. He was himself a peaceable man, a loyal subject, going quietly about his own business, when Jabus intercepted, to his own hurt, the sabre destined for his grey head. Matthew Cooper, his tenant's father-in-law, was as peaceable and well-disposed, and, if so, might not the bulk of the so-called rebels have been the same? In his gratitude to Jabus, he denounced the mounted yeoman who had sabred him as a drunken and bloodthirsty miscreant, though in the hurry, excitement and agitation, attending his own withdrawal from the press by Mr. Mabbott, he had failed to identify his pursuer with John Wormsley's dashing friend, and the exclamation of Ben Travis had not reached his ear in the confusion. Easy-going Mr. Ashton also seemed transformed by the event. He had certainly lost the valuable services of his apprentice for some time to come, but that was the very least ingredient in the cup of his wrath. By faithful intelligence service, by persevering industry, by a thousand little actions, which had shown his interest in his employers, and his devotion to his old friends, Jabus had won a place in his master's esteem and affection no other apprentice of any grade had ever attained. And now that Jabus had risked the dangers of the soldier in the streets to bear his beloved daughter to a place of safety, and had braved the storm of foot and horse and fire and steel to rescue his brother-in-law by endangering his own life or limbs. His admiration and gratitude rose to their highest, and in proportion his denunciation of an outrage which called for such a sacrifice was strong and vehement, all the more that he sympathised with the objects of the meeting. When he and Simon Clegg, who had been drawn to the scene in his dinner hour with others like moths to a candle, picked up his cavalry friend Robert Hindley, from amongst the building materials and disengaged him from his dead horse, he could not refrain from telling the disabled warrior, with all a friend's frankness, that it served him right. Open expression of private opinion on the conduct of rulers was dangerous at that period, as may be supposed, but private opinion became public opinion, too strong and too universal to be put in fetters. 
Mr. Tyus, the Times reporter, had been taken prisoner on the hustings, and it was imagined that only a one-sided account forwarded by the magistracy in justification of their conduct would reach London. But other intelligent reporters were at large. The garbled statements sent to the government press were confuted by the truth-telling narratives of Messrs. Archibald Prentice and John Edward Taylor, which appeared the following day and roused the indignation of the realm. These statements, being more than substantiated by the Times reporter on his liberation, national indignation rose to a ferment. This alarmed the Manchester magistrates. A meeting was hurriedly arranged to take place on Thursday the 19th, the third day from Peterloo, at the police station, then adjourned to the Star Inn in Deansgate, and, as though the meeting had been a public one, resolutions were passed, thanking magistrates and soldiers for their services on the previous Monday. Then Manchester rose, as it were, en masse, to vindicate its own honour and reject participation in a disgraceful deed. A declaration, says one historian, was issued, protesting against the Star Inn resolutions, which in the course of two or three days received close upon five thousand signatures, in obtaining which none were more active than Mr. Ashton, and, despite his paralysis, Mr. Chadwick. Old Mrs. Clues talked her customers into signing, and Parson Brooks was not idle. Mr. William Clough, whose old servant Matthew Cooper had been shot down at his own door, gave the Tanners a holiday, that they might influence their fellows and Simon Clegg, Tom Hume, and Nathaniel Bradshaw seemed ubiquitous. They went to work with such determined zeal. They did not feel thankful to the magistrates for the blood shed on Peterloo Monday. Neither did the bulk of the inhabitants, and an energetic protest against the proceedings and representations of the magistracy was the result. To counteract this, the Prince Regent, through his mouthpiece, Lord Sidmouth, sent his thanks to the magistrates and the military leaders for their prompt, decisive and efficient measures. But this, instead of calming, lashed the public mind to frenzy. Meetings to remonstrate with the regent and to petition for inquiry were held in all the large towns. Sir Francis Burnett, presiding at one, held in Westminster. Subscriptions were also got up for the relief of such wounded and disabled persons as had crept into holes and corners to hide themselves and their wounds from nading and his constabulary. And here too William Ashton and William Clough worked hand in a hand to bring relief to sufferers not in the infirmary, and Parson Brooks, to the disgust of some of his clerical brethren, lent his aid in ferreting out the miserables, if he did not ostentatiously flourish his subscription in their service, and I rather think that a certain J.S. in the subscription list represented the might of the grammar school headmaster, Dr. Jeremiah Smith, but I could not take an affidavit on the subject, but when the wounded as far as ascertained amounted to six hundred, irrespective of the killed, subscriptions had need to be many and ample. Another token of the change in public sentiment was shown in the satires and pasquinades, which appeared on the walls, or were distributed from hand to hand. Previously to Peterloo, a set of anonymous verses, in ridicule of the popular leader, had been distributed. They began, and were added as follows. Orator Hunt. Blythe Harry Hunt was an orator bold, taught away bravely and blunt, and Rome in her glory, and Athens of old, with all their loud talkers of whom we are told, couldn't match orator Hunt. Blythe Harry Hunt was a sightly man, something twixt giant and runt. His paunch was a large one, his visage was one, and to hear his long speeches vast multitudes ran, O oh, rare orator Hunt. Orator Hunt was the man for a riot, bully in language and front, and thought when a nation had troubles to sigh at, was quite unbecoming to sit cool and quiet, O oh, rare orator Hunt. Our orator Hunt's many speeches will close, tedious, bombastic and blunt, 
in a halter or diadem god only knows the sequel might well an arch conjurer pose o oh, rare a rater hunt sufficient has been given to show the nature of the lampoon without repeating its scurrility the following of which we only quote the first two stanzas is of pretty much the same order though emanating from the other side and after terrible provocation had been given the renowned achievements of peterloo on the glorious sixteenth of august eighteen nineteen by Sir Hugo Burlo Furioso Dimulo Spinizimo, Bart, NYC, and ASS. The music by the celebrated Dr. Horsefood to be had at the Cat and Bagpipes, St. Mary's Gate, Manchester. When foul sedition stalking through the land, it then behoves each patriotic band of noble-minded yeoman cavaliers to sally forth and rush upon the mob and execute the magisterial job of cutting off the ragamuffin's ears how valiantly we met that crew of infants men and women too upon the plain of peterloo and gloriously did ha and hew the damned reforming gang our swords were sharp, you may suppose, some lost their ears, some lost their nose. Our horses trod upon their toes, ere they could run to escape our blows. With shouts the welkin rang, so keen were we to rout these swine, old shoals of constables in line. We galloped o'er in style so fine, by orders of the sapient nine. First friends, then foes, laid flat, by Richardson's best grinding skill, our blades were set with right good will, that we these rogues might bleed or kill, and give them of reform their fill. And what do you think of that? And so on, the satire ran, in mock bravuro style, through the whole course of piano, sotto voice, pianissima mento, and con baldanza, with footnotes to strengthen or elucidate the text and that the writer remained undiscovered and unprosecuted spoke loudly for the reaction which had taken place in men's minds chapter twenty one wounded at the extreme end of mr mabbott's long double countered shop was an expansive archway closed in general by folding doors through which entrance was afforded to a narrow sitting room the length of which was just by so much less than the width of the shop, as was required for a passage and staircase. Once a year the open archway revealed a shimmering mass of snowy sugar work, the towers and turrets of a castle on a rock, or the illuminated windows of a magnificent palace, fit for any princess of fairyland, with pleasure gardens and lake or fountain and pond wherein stately swans floated and were overlooked by dames and cavaliers, created by the confectioner and his satellites. For the fifty other weeks, it was simply a snug parlour, comfortably furnished according to the fashion of the time, and it was in this room we left Jabus, whilst good-natured Ben Travis, leaving his more patriotic comrades to hack and hew at their pleasure, galloped hither and thither, in search of a surgeon, to dress the wounded arm. Every doctor in the infirmary had his hands full, Dr. Hull from his windows in Mosley Street, and Dr. Hardy from his in Piccadilly, had been satisfied that if they ventured forth, they might soon need doctoring themselves, and they both pleaded medical etiquette in excuse for their lukewarmness. They were physicians, not surgeons. He bethought himself of Mr. Hurtley in Oldham Street, but even he had more than one wounded patient in his surgery and was loath to encounter the danger outside. Ben Travis, however, would take no denial. He waited until sundry gaping wounds were closed, cuts plastered and bandaged, a broken limb set and a bullet extracted, even lending a hand himself where unskilled help could be helpful being less bemused with liquor than many of his cavalry corps. Then, although they were almost within a stone's throw of their destination, 
as Oldham Street was not safe for a civilian to cross on foot with loaded cannon in such close proximity. Travis mounted the surgeon behind him, the latter not sorry to have the yeoman's capacious body in its conspicuous uniform for a shield as they dashed across into Bat Piccadilly to Mabbott's back door. Ere they rode off, the younger man cast a sharp glance of scrutiny at Chadwick's drawing-room windows, and bowed low in recognition of the face for which he was looking, the face he had seen so pale and pitiful, bending over an afflicted father, and so shocked to hear of even an apprentice wounded in that father's behalf. Ben Travis had a big body, and a big heart, but he had little knowledge of the hearts of womankind, or he might have found another solution for Alan Chadwick's fainting fit. He did not know how she had trembled for another on seeing him dismount at Mr. Hurtley's door, nor how she had watched, too sick and sad to descend to the dining room, when the spoiled dinner was at length set on the table. Watched eagerly and anxiously, her heart's pulsations counting each second a minute, as hours elapsed before she saw them mount and ride away, and noted the direction they took. And she saw no admiration in the low bow of the fine soldierly young gentleman, only the polite salutation of a stranger, introduced casually by the untoward events of the day, albeit having rendered her father a service, and professed himself the friend of Jabus. She was bound to recognise him as he passed. To Jabus himself, lying faint and exhausted with loss of blood, on kind Mr. Mabbott's chintz-covered squab sofa, everything was a haze, and the people around him little more than voices. He was perfectly conscious when Mr. Mabbott hastily cut away the sleeve of his jacket, and bound the wounded arm as tightly as towels could bind. When Mr. Ashton put his troubled face into the confectioner's small parlour, Mr. Mabbott was in the act of reaching from a corner cupboard a small square spirit decanter, and an engraved wine-glass, in order to administer a dose of brandy to the young man, then rapidly sinking into unconsciousness. Under its influence, he revived for a while, but as the blood gradually soaked through the toweling, he grew fainter, in spite of brandy, and by the time Ben Travis, who had surely kept the promise made in schoolboy days, brought Dr. Hurtley to his aid, he had lapsed into a stupor, from which the manipulations of the surgeon barely aroused him. You should have tied a ligature tightly as possible round the arm, above the wound first thing, said the surgeon, addressing those around him. A bit of tape, a strip of linen, a garter, anything narrow to stop the hemorrhage. Had this been done, there would have been less effusion of blood, and our patient would not have been so utterly prostrated. Just so, just so, assented Mr. Ashton, adding, But Mr. Mabbott had done his best, no doubt, interrupted the surgeon, or our young friend might have bled to death, but the tight, narrow ligature would have been better, and many a valuable life may have been saved or lost this day, through that bit of knowledge, or the want of it. Mr. Ashton, just so, just so, I dare say you are right, was followed up by... Shall we be able to remove him tonight, Mr. Hurtley? He's my apprentice and has been injured whilst bravely protecting your opposite neighbour, Mr. Chadwick, my brother-in-law. I should like to get him home to be under Mrs. Ashton's care, as well as to relieve Mr. Mabbott, to whom I am sure we all feel greatly indebted. Don't name it, I beg, at fearful times like this, said Mr. Mabbott with a shudder. It does not do to think of troubles or of ceremony, but I do not imagine the doctor would counsel the young man's removal tonight, even if the road were clear and safe. Certainly not, replied Mr. Hurtley, as he packed up his lint and instruments, and, in my opinion, if you remove him tomorrow you must do it carefully, on every account, and will have to smuggle him away in a hackney coach, lest he should be pounced upon as a wounded rebel. Two days, however, elapsed before Mr. Mabbott's sofa lost its occupant, 
and even then the strong arm of Tom Hume and the loving care of Bess were needed to help Jabus, feeble and wan, to the hackney carriage brought up to the back door, which bore him slowly away, avoiding the main streets until he passed under the arched gateway in Back Mosley Street, whence he had last emerged at a headlong pace to prevent Miss Augusta getting into danger. Some remembrance of this flashed through the brain of Jabus as the coach stopped in the courtyard, and on the house doorsteps he beheld Mrs. Ashton, Augusta, and Ellen Chadwick, all three waiting to receive him, as if he had been a wounded relative returning from far-off victories to his own hearth. Nay, the very servants hovered in the background, even crossed Kezia, pressing to have a first look at him. Mrs. Ashton, herself with the graceful dignity which sat so well upon her, went down the steps to lead him up and into the house, and as she touched his left hand and unwounded arm, she said impressively, Jabez Clegg, I understand we owe our brother's life to your self-abnegation, if not that of our daughter also. I regret that your noble intervention should have cost you so dear, but I thank you most truly, and shall not forget it. The stately lady's eyes were humid as she led Jabus into their common parlour, the room in which Augusta had displayed his specimens of incipient artistry, and there placed him on the large soft sofa, already prepared with pillows for his reception. The attention touched him to the heart. The humble apprentice, feeling himself honoured, raised the lady's hand to his lips as gracefully and reverently as ever did knight of old romance, and then he would have closed his eyes for very weariness, but a little soft warm hand stole into his feeble one, and, thrilling through him, a faint tinge chased the deathly pallor from his face, as Augusta's voice, full of commiseration, said apologetically, I had no idea, Jabez, that I was sending you into danger when I asked you to look for Uncle Chadwick. I am so sorry you have been hurt. He held the little hand of his master's daughter for one or two delicious minutes, while he answered feebly, Never mind, Miss Ashton, I was only too glad to be there in time, and lapsed into so ethereal a dream as he released it that the low, broken, grateful thanks of Ellen Chadwick left but the impression on his mind that she was very much in earnest, and had called him Mr. Clegg. Mr. Clegg, when had the college boy, the blue-coat apprentice, been anything but Jabez Clegg? Mr. Clegg, it was from such lips social recognition, and so blent strangely with his dream. Ah, could he but have known how much of latent tenderness was embodied in those incoherent expressions of a daughter's gratitude, or that the speaker dared not trust her faltering tongue with his Christian name. Mrs. Ashton called the young ladies away. My dears, you had better resume your occupations, and leave Jabez to repose. It is not well to crowd about an invalid on so sultry a day as this. So Miss Chadwick went with her tatting shuttle, back to her seat by the one window, where the friendly shade of the dove-coloured curtains screened from observation any glances which might chance to stray from the tatting to the sofa. And Miss Ashton went back to her music stool, where the sunbeams falling through the other window lit up her lovely profile, shot a glint of gold through her hair, and showed the dimples in her white shoulder to the half-shut, dreaming eyes of Jabus, who listened entranced as she practised scales and battle pieces, waltzes and quadrilles, totally unconscious that she was feeding a fever in the soul of the apprentice more to be feared than the stroke of Aspinall's sabre, though it had cut into the bone. Not that she was a simple schoolgirl and ignorant of the power of beauty, she was pretty well as romantic as any girl of that romantic age, who, being fifteen, looked a year older, and learned the art of fascination from the four-volume novels of the period. 
Mrs. Ashton herself subscribed to the fashionable circulating library of the town, but she was somewhat choice in her reading, and had Miss Augusta stopped where her mother did, she would have done well. But it so happened that after feasting on the wholesome peas her mother provided, she fell with avidity on hus, obtained surreptitiously elsewhere. Kisses from Augusta could always coax coins from Papa, and, as a Miss Bohanna kept up in a well-known, well-stocked, circulating library in Shewed Hill, albeit in a cellar, its contiguity to Bradshaw Street and Mrs. Broadbent's enabled Miss Ashton, or Cicely for her, to smuggle in amongst her school books other fictions, such as Elizabeth Helm and Anna Maria Roche used to concoct, and Samuel Richardson provided, to delight our grandmothers with. So Miss Ashton was quite prepared to be admired and play the heroine prematurely, but she had been reared in the same house with Jabez, had been caressed and waited upon by him as a child, and anything so absurd as her father's apprentice falling in love with her had never dawned upon her apprehension. Then not even his wounded arm could make him handsome enough for a hero, so she plunged through the Battle of Prague and Lodoiska and glided into the Copenhagen waltz with no suspicion of a listener more than ordinary. Mrs. Ashton, who was backstitching a shirt wristband, family linen then was made at home, imagined that Jabus was dozing, and, unwilling to disturb him, only spoke when a false note or a passage out of time called for a low-voiced hint to her daughter, or when she found occasion to make some slight observation to the equally silent Ellen. Presently, the clock in the hall proclaimed five. Miss Ashton closed music, books and piano. Miss Chadwick completed a loop, then put her tatting away in a small, oblong, red Morocco reticule. Mrs. Ashton laid the wristband in her workbasket, which she put out of sight in a panel cupboard within the wall, sheathed the scissors hanging from her girdle, and folded up the leather housewife containing her cut skeins of thread, etc. James brought in the tea board with its genuine china tea service, plates with cake and bread and butter, and whilst he went back to Kezia for the tea urn, in walked Mr. Ashton, and with him the Reverend Joshua Brooks. One might have supposed Joshua's first salutation would have been to the lady of the house. Nothing of the kind, with a passing nod to Mrs. Ashton, who had extended her hand, he marched straight to the sofa and greeted its occupant with, Well, young cheat the fishes, so you've been in the wars again. Yes, sir said Jabus, attempting to rise. Lie still, lad. And so you thought a velveteen jacket, defensive armour against sharpened steel. I never thought about it, sir. Ugh. Then I suppose you reckon a young man's arm worth less than an old man's head, eh? Jabus smiled. Certainly, sir. Ugh. I thought as much. Then darting a keen inquisitive glance from under his shaggy eyebrows at the prostrate young fellow, he added in his very raspiest tones, And I dare say you've no notion whose sabre carved the wing of the goose so cleverly. What little blood was left in his body seemed to mount to the face of Jabus, the old scar on his brow, which every year made less conspicuous, purpled and grew livid. Old Joshua needed no more. Ah, I see you do. Well, are you inclined to forgive the fellow this time? All ears were on the alert. Jabez caught the quick turn of his kind master's head. He hesitated, paled, and flushed again. Joshua Brooks waited. There was some indecision in the reply when it did come. I am not sure, sir, but he was very drunk. I don't think he would have done it if he'd been sober. Just so, Jabez, just so, assented Mr. Ashton, with evident satisfaction and a tap on his snuff-box lid. Ben Travis had revealed the name of Mr. Chadwick's assailant to the manufacturer and he to the chaplain. Oh, that's your opinion, is it? cried the latter crustily wheeling sharply round to disguise a smile. 
Here, madam, let's have a cup of sober tea after that. I think, Mr. Brutes, said Mrs. Ashton as she seated herself, with all due deference to you, I think you ask too much from Jabus. I do not consider drunkenness any excuse for brutality. No excuse for the brute, madam, certainly. But a reason why a reasoning man should forgive the brute incapable of reason. Just so, parson, chimed in Mr. Ashton, laying his Barcelona handkerchief across his knee. I do not see it, sir, argued Mrs. Ashton, handing a willow pattern cup and saucer with his tea to her interlocutor. A man who is a brute when intoxicated should keep sober. For my own part, I should be loath to let the same stick beat me twice. Our apprentice has borne quite too much from that fellow. She waxed indignant, and there is a limit to forgiveness. Yes, madam, answered the parson snappishly. There is a limit to forgiveness, but the limit is not seven times, but seventy times seven. There was no more to be said. The rough chaplain spoke with authority and from experience, and Jabus knew it. Chapter 22 Mr. Clegg However grateful Mrs. Ashton might be, she never lost sight of her personal dignity, and had no idea of admitting Jabus on terms of equality after that first reception. In his helpless condition, he required attention, which she could not condescend to render personally. Yet she was as little inclined to delegate the duty to Kezia, who was never over well disposed towards him, and might have resented the call to wait on apprentice lad, or to Sicily, who was too young to have the run of a young man's chamber. It was like herself to hit on a happy mean, and invite Bessume at once to satisfy her own longings, and meet the requirements of the case, by waiting on her foster child in his helplessness, bringing with her her own boy, now two years old, to be committed to willing Sicily's care, when the mother was herself engaged. Yet the apprentice never again sank into the old ruts. His bed in the attic was turned over to his successor. From that parlour, where he had lain and listened to Augusta's music, and Parson Brooks dictum, where Mrs. Ashton had placed his pillows, and Ellen Chadwick had supplied his wants with such intuitive perception at tick time, from that room he went to a chamber on an upper floor, furnished neatly but plainly with due regard to comfort. There was a mahogany camp bedstead, draped with chintz of most extraordinary device. The bed was of feathers, not flock. An oak chest of drawers, which did duty for a dressing table, stood by the window, which itself overlooked the yard, and on the top stood a small oval swing looking glass. There were small strips of carpet along the two sides of the bed, which did not touch the wall, an almost triangular washstand in one corner, and near the middle of the room a rush bottomed chair and a small tripod table. There was also a cushioned easy chair which had a suggestiveness of being there for that special occasion only, and Jabus, who on his first glance around began to speculate whether the whole would not vanish with his convalescence, was reassured when he saw that his wooden box had been brought from the attic and stood against the wall. The six-foot bronze bearded man of forty remains a child to the mother who bore him, or the woman who nursed him and, as she had laid him in his cradle when a baby, Bess helped Jabus to his new bed, fed him with the beef tea which Kezia had prepared for a wonder without a grumble, gave him the cooling draught Mr. Hurtley had sent in, smoothed his pillows for repose, and kissed his brow with a God bless thee, much as she had done when he was an ailing child, but with all the excess of motherliness her own maternity had given. Nevertheless, he did not sleep readily. Neither Bessie's soothing hand, nor the soft bed, superinduced slumber. He was modest, and Mr. Clegg haunted him, 
He could not see the connection between his impulsive rush forward to check the yeoman's plunging steed and his employer's recognition of the service rendered. I only did my duty, he debated with himself as he lay there, with a mere streak of light from the glimmering rushlight showing between the closely drawn curtains. I only did my duty. Anyone else would have done the same in my place if I'd once thought of consequences and grasped the reins deliberately. There would have been some bravery in that, but I never thought of the sword, not I. I only thought of poor old Mr. Chadwick and Molly, and I'm sure Mr. Mabbott's ready hand did as good service as mine. Only I happened to get hurt. Yes, that's it, and they are sorry for me. I wonder if that ruffinly fellow did know whom he was striking at. I hardly think he did, he was so very tipsy. If I fancied he did, I, but he could not. He was just blind drunk. What a pity for such a handsome fellow, not older than I am, and a gentleman's son too. Forgive him? I don't think I've much to forgive. I bear the pain twice over for all the kind things that have been said and done since. Tea in the parlour with Parson Brooks, and all, and this handsome bedroom, handsome only in untutored eyes, and all the thanks I have had for so little, and oh, the bliss of holding Augusta's delicate hand in mine, and hearing the music those white fingers made. It's worth the pain three times over, and Mr. Clegg too, Mr. Clegg, how like a gentleman it does sound, Will anybody call me Mr. Clegg, besides Miss Chadwick? How fond she must be of her father, from the way she thanked me. Ah, Jabus, what oculist can cure blindness such as thine? If less consecutive, still in some such current, ran the young man's thoughts, until chaos came, and his closed eyes saw innumerable Mr. Cleggs, written on walls and floor and curtains, and a delicious symphony seemed to chorus the words and lap him in Elysium. After that, once each day, Mrs. Ashton paid him a brief visit of inspection and inquiry, generally timed so as to meet the surgeon. Mr. Ashton, with less of ceremony, dropped in occasionally to bring him a newspaper, book or pamphlet to beguile the hours, and was not above loitering for a pleasant chat on matters indoors and out the state of political feeling and of business, in a manner so friendly, Jabus was at a loss to account for it. Once or twice Augusta tapped at the door to ask if Jabus was better, and to hope he would soon be well, and the simple words ran through his brain with a thousand chimerical meanings. Joshua Brooks paid him a couple of visits, brought him papers of sweetmeats and messages from Mrs. Clues, and a Latin testament, and a worn Aenid from his own stores, as a little light reading. Mrs. Chadwick too made her appearance at his bedside, with kindly and grateful words from her husband, and amongst them he was in a fair way of becoming elevated into a hero, to his own hurt. Simon Clegg, who pulled off his thick Sunday shoes in the kitchen, and went upstairs in his stocking feet, lest he should make a clatter and spoil the carpets, counteracted the mischief, and somewhat clipped the pinions of soaring imagination. Jabus, his arm bandaged and sustained by a sling, lay with his head against the straight high back of his padded chair, between the window and the fireplace, which glowed not with live coals, but a bow-pot of sunflowers and hollyhocks from Simon's garden. At his feet lay little Syme, fast asleep, with his fat arms round the neck of Nelson the black retriever, which had somehow contrived to sneak past Kezia with his tail between his legs, and to follow Bess upstairs, where he had established himself in perfect content. Simon greeted his foster son with bated breath, awed no doubt by the lamp-bearing statues in the hall and on the staircase, and hardly raised his voice above a whisper while he stayed. He had much to tell, which the reader already knows, but he took his leave with quite a long oration, 
impressed no doubt by the comfort in that chamber, as well as by the grandeur in rooms of which he had caught a glimpse through open doors. Jabez himself, being still feeble, had spoken but little. "'My lad,' said he, "'this is a grand place, but dunna you let it mat you proud, and I hope, as you're thankful, you am fallen among such kind folk.' "'Indeed I am. You did now, but what am we your duty, my lad, as I trust they always wilt, and as getting a maister and missus, in ten thousand to mat so much on a cut in apprentice's arm, ay, though it were got in saving one of their own kin. Look you, Jabus, all the maesters I ever saw afore, thou as prentices, body and soul, were their own, and you've lit on your feet, I can tell you, and you canna do too much for such folk. I see them makin' a man of you, and dunna you spoil all, be thinking you an earned it, and an a reek to it. We're unprofitable servants, the best on us, and dunna you harbour any malice against chappers chopped at you. Them yeomanry cavalry were as drunk as fiddlers and as blind as bats. They took the chance with Rook, and came off better than some folk. So thank God it's no worse, and bear no malice, and thank God has sent you there in nick of time. In little more than a fortnight, Jabus was downstairs again, although his arm, not being thoroughly healed, yet needed support, and he was not hurried into the warehouse. Neither was he again invited to join the family, Mrs. Ashton having objected to Mr. Ashton's proposition. It would lift the young man out of his sphere, William, and do him more harm than good. Only very strong heads can stand sudden elevation, and it is well to make no more haste than good speed. But Mr. Ashton's just so was less definite than ordinary, and he took a second pinch of snuff unawares with a prolonged emphasis which supplied the place of words. To the observer, Mr. Ashton's snuff-box contained as much eloquence as did Lord Burley's celebrated wig. He had taken a liking to the lad from the first, paid very little deference to Mrs. Grundy, and gave Jabez credit for a stronger head than did his more cautious and philosophic lady. Yet Jabez, to his surprise, found that his little room downstairs had undergone a transformation. It was no longer a bare office, fired only with a desk and stool. Desk and stool were still there, but a carpet, hanging shelves, a few useful boots and other furniture had been introduced, the result being a compact parlour. Mrs. Ashton had her own way of showing goodwill. His previous application to work in that room when his fellow apprentices in over hours were cracking jokes on the kitchen settle, lounging about the yard, tormenting or being tormented by Kezia, had served somewhat to isolate and lift him above them, albeit he took his meals in the kitchen with the rest. This separation was now confirmed by orders Kezia received to serve Clegg's dinner in his own room, orders which Kezia resented with asperity and at least three days ill humour, and which James declined to execute. He was not going to disgrace his cloth by waiting on prentice lads. Ready-handed Cicely came to the rescue and took the office on herself, amid the banter of the kitchen, which the quick-witted maid returned with right good will and right good temper. Permission to receive his friends in his own room occasionally had been graciously accorded by Mrs. Ashton herself, with a characteristic observation. They are worthy people, Jabez Clegg, and you owe them a son's duty. Besides, you need some relaxation. The overstrained bow is apt to snap, and all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Altogether he was more than satisfied. He was not demonstrative, but his heart swelled as he felt within himself that all these little things were stepping stones upwards and he mentally resolved to mount them fairly. He recognised that he was rising, and ere the week was out, 
he found that others recognised it also. His blood-stained garments had been removed, whither he knew not, and he had to fall back on his grey-free Sunday suit. Be sure he began to calculate the chances of getting a fresh one. As he was able to go out, he was employed on outdoor business, until his arm should regain its full vitality, and one of his errands was with a note to Mr. Chadwick's tailor in King Street. At first he thought there was some mistake, when the fraction of a man proceeded without more ado to take his measure. Saturday night proved there had been no mistake, on his bed, accompanied by a very kind note from Mr. Chadwick, written with his left hand, lay not only a well-cut, well-made suit of clothes, but a hat, white linen shirts, neckcloths, and hose. Did ever a young girl turn up her back hair, or young man assume his first coat indifferently? To Jabus the foundling, the blue-coat apprentice, this was not merely a first coat, not merely a badge of approaching manhood. The whole outfit, provided as it was by his master's brother-in-law, seemed a recognition of the station he was henceforth to fill. No clerk in the counting-house was so well equipped as he, when he stood before his oval swing-glass, for the first time far too small, and endeavoured to survey himself therein, that fine September Sunday morning, I will not presume to say that he looked the conventional gentleman in that suit of glossy brown broadcloth and beaver hat. I will not say that he did not feel stiff in them. Only use gives ease. But this I will say, that a more manly figure never gave shape to garments, or a more noble head to a hat, albeit there was more of strength and beauty in the face it shaded. His forehead was broad and well developed, the reflective as well as the perceptive faculties were there. There was just a slight defensive rise on the L's straight nose. The eyebrows were full, save where a scar broke the line of one. Firm but pleasant were mouth and dimpled chin, and the lower jaw was somewhat massive, but his full grey eyes, dark almost to blackness, and standing far apart, were clear and deep as wells, where truth lay hid, though deep emotion had power to kindle them with the luminosity of stars. I am afraid he was not the only one on whom Parson Gatliff's eloquence was thrown away that Sabbath morning. If he looked up at the blue-coat boys in the Chetham Gallery, with their quaint blue robes and neat bounds, to throw memory back and imagination forward, others were doing likewise. From old Simon in his free seat, to his envious fellow prentices in the pew, whose mocking grimaces drew upon them the sharp censure of the beadle. Party spirit was then at a white heat. Had Peterloo been written on his forehead, it could not have marked him out for curious eyes more surely than his sling. Greetings, not altogether congratulatory, followed him through the churchyard, but old Simon caught his left hand in a tremulous grasp, his eyes moist with proud emotion, Tom Hume beamed upon him, and Mrs. Clues, energetic as ever, overtook them a few yards from the chapter house, just as Joshua Brutes emerged from the door. "'Well, my lad, I'm glad to see you at church again,' she exclaimed, shaking him warmly by the left hand. "'I hardly knew you in your fine clothes.' They've made quite a gentleman of you. We shall have to call you Mr. Clegg now, I reckon. Now, Mother Clues, don't you give Jabus some bug of that sort. It's sweet, but not wholesome. Fine feathers make fine birds. He's as proud as a peacock already. Mr. Clegg, indeed. And him, apprentice lad, not out of his time. Let him stick to the name we gave him at his baptism. It's worth all your fine misters. And Joshua turned off muttering, Mr. Clegg, indeed, as he went away. Neither the old woman in her antiquated gown and kerchief covered much, nor the old parson in his cassock and square cap modulated their loud voices. Jabez blushed painfully. Both had touched sensitive chords. 
But others had heard the Mr. Clegg, and he heard it again from Kezia and the apprentices in every tone of mockery and derision. Then, as it travelled into the warehouse, he bore it with set teeth through many a painful week, until the title stuck to him, and the taunt was forgotten in the force of habit. Chapter 23 In the Theatre Royal It has been said that Madame Broadbent had various subtle ways of advertising her academy, as the directory has it, by which she generally contrived to kill two birds with one stone. One of these would scarcely have been practicable in any but a theatrical town like Manchester, where not even the fierceness of party politics could close the theatre doors. She was particularly fond of a good play, and as particularly careful of her own pocket. So she watched for such occasions as a special benefit or bespeak night, to engage one of the dress boxes and take tickets for a select party of her pupils. The young ladies, apart from all natural love of amusement and display, were taught to regard their admission to Mrs. Broadbent's train as a high honour, a mark of exceeding distinction, and few were the parents, so stern or so niggardly, as to refuse the four shillings for a box ticket when Madame invited and mispleaded. The then Theatre Royal in Fountain Street, which was opened in 1807 under Macready's management and brought to the ground by fire in 1844, was in 1820 a building so capacious, so solidly built, it might not fear comparison with Drury Lane. Stage, scene rooms, dressing rooms were all on an extensive scale. There were three tiers of boxes, a large pit, and an immense gallery breaking the line of the third tier. With the exception of the large side boxes, which were partially on the stage, all these boxes were open to the view, having only a divisional barrier the height of the parapet, light iron pillars supporting the weight above. There were no chairs, only narrow, base-covered benches and a centre backs, and the theatre was lighted by sperm oil lamps, those round the auditorium being suspended by cords over pulleys, so as to be lowered for lighting, trimming, etc. But the glory of that theatre, of which it was shown at a later date, was its box lobby, a lofty open promenade wide as a street and long in proportion, for its one grand entrance was in Fountain Street, the other in Bat Mosley Street. Only for the step or two at either end, carriages might have driven through, or, depositing their living loads within, at the saloon doors, have turned easily, and driven back. This lobby was naturally a lounge, as well as a waiting place for servants and others, with wraps and patterns, neither carriages nor hackney coaches being numerous, and the streets being, well, not quite so clean or well paved as at present. The ten days' trial of Henry Hunt and his compatriots at York had, as is well known, resulted in sentence of imprisonment for different terms, to the discomfiture of one party, the exultation of the other. Close upon the promulgation of this sentence came Easter week, at the beginning of April, 1820, when Jabus had little more than a month to serve of his apprenticeship. Edmund Keane was then playing at the Theatre Royal, supported by Sophia McGibbon, daughter of Woodfall, the memorable printer of Junius, a favourite on the Manchester boards either to mark their satisfaction at the result of the trial, or their admiration of the great tragedian, the officers of the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry bespoke Othello for the Wednesday evening, and Mrs. Broadbent made the most of the glorious opportunity. She engaged a box close to the centre of the dress circle, on terms well understood, and, as small people take less room than large ones, and her front row was very juvenile, she contrived to make it a profitable investment, even though she took a teacher with her at a lower rate. The young ladies assembled at the school and made quite a procession to the theatre, where Mrs. Broadbent's own maid took charge of hats and cloaks and waited drearily in the saloon. Then, duly marshalled by Madame Broadbent and Miss Nuttall, they filed into the box decorously and took their seats, the youngest in the van the whole programme having been rehearsed and re-rehearsed for a day or two beforehand. A bouquet of white rosebuds, they might have been called, 
white muslin was so general, but one young lady blushed in pink gauze, and Augusta Ashton's lovely head and shoulders were set off by delicate blue crepe. There were round necklaces of coral or pearl, long loose gloves of cambric or kid, and every damsel in her teens had her fan. But her fans commend me to Madame Broadbent's. It was no light trifle of ivory or sandalwood, but of strong green paper spotted with gold, with ribs and frame of ebony, and it measured nearly half a yard when closed. A well-saved, long-waisted, stiff-brigaded robe and petticoat might have been a wedding dress, kept for state occasions, but that fan, slung by a ribbon from her wrist, was part of her individuality, the symbol of her authority, inseparable from her walking self. A relic of her younger days, she employed it, citing Queen Charlotte as her exemplar, to arrest attention, to admonish, to chastise, and woe to the luckless little lady on whom it came in admonition. The box was filled to the very door, where Miss Nuttall kept guard. Madame Broadbent displayed her own important person on the third row, above the curly heads of the smaller fry, and to Augusta Ashton being a profitable pupil, of whom she had reason to be proud, was allotted a seat next to herself. The house was full and fashionable, both stage boxes being occupied by members of the Manchester Yeomanry, resplendent in silver and blue. Lawrence Aspinall, John Walmsley and Ben Travis were of the party. In the pit were the critics, pressing as closely as possible to the stage. Nods and smiles from friends in different quarters of the theatre greeted the component parts of Madame Broadbent's bevy of innocence, and smiles responded. Then rose the green curtain upon Edmund Keane's Othello and Mrs. McGibbon's Desdemona. The audience was enthralled. Act by act the players kept attention fixed, and all went well until the last scene, but as Othello pressed the murderous pillow down, one of Madame Broadbent's white frock misses in the front row, with whose relatives Desdemona lodged, when she was not Desdemona, started up and cried out piteously, He's killing Mrs. McGibbon! He's killing Mrs. McGibbon! The clear voice rang through the house, to the consternation of the actors, the amusement of some, and the annoyance of the audience. Some of the officers laughed outright in the very face of the tragic moor, but Madame Broadbent was furious, all the more that she was bound to suppress her passion then and there. For the credit of her academy, she, however, felt bound to resent so flagrant a breach of decorum. Tapping the tearful culprit on the shoulder with her ready fan, in a stern whisper, scarcely less audible than the child's impulsive tribute to the great tragedian, she asked, How can you demean yourself so far, miss, to the disgrace of the school? And beckoning the child forth, she was passed to Miss Nuttall, the very back of the box, sobbing more for Mrs. McGibbon than for Mrs. Broadbent. This caused a change of places which brought Miss Ashton more prominently into view. Lawrence Aspinall, an ardent admirer of beauty, put his hands on the shoulder of the officer before him and said, Good heavens, Wormsley! Do you see that lovely creature in Mother Broadbent's box? Which, was the obtuse answer, which, contemptuously echoed, the divine beauty in celestial blue, who is she? And his admiring gaze brought a conscious blush to the young lady's forehead, although the querist was beyond her hearing. In blue? and Wormsley lazily scanned the group. Oh, that's Charlotte's cousin, Augusta Ashton. Yes, she is rather pretty, and the married man turned away to the stage. Rather pretty? She's an angel? You must introduce me. Well, well, answered the other testily, anxious to end a colloquy, which distracted his attention from the tragedy. I'll see, but she's only a schoolgirl, not yet sixteen. Egad, but she looks seventeen, and she'll mend of that disqualification every day. And still he kept his eyes on Augusta in a manner extremely disconcerting, though her romantic little heart fluttered, for in him she recognised the Adonis, who had reared his horse so threateningly in front of her uncle Chadwick's house. The green curtain came down amid universal plaudits. 
Ladies rose to rest themselves and chat, as was the custom. Gentlemen quitted their seats to join friends elsewhere, to lounge in saloon or box lobby, or to take a hasty glass at the Garrick's head adjoining. Amongst the latter were Wormsley and Aspinall, but they did not return when the prompter's bell rang the curtain up. There was a pas de deux of Tyrolean peasants by the chief dancer of the company, then followed an interlude, and then a comic song, all before the last piece. But the comrades did not return, and Augusta found herself wondering whether the handsome officer with the rich copper-coloured hair would come back at all. They did make their appearance during the progress of the drama Monk Lewis's Castle Spectre, in which Mrs. McGibbon gave ocular demonstration that she was not killed, both seemingly exhilarated, but they left again before the drama concluded. Well drilled as were Madame Broadbent's pupils, they could not quit their box in the same order they entered it. Big people so seldom recognise the right of little ones to precedence. They straggled into the saloon separated by the crowd. There Madame Broadbent, assisted by Miss Nuttall, collected her brood, and passing on to the box lobby, they looked around for their respective attendants. There was one, a fine young man, in height some five feet ten, who sprang forward with shawl and calash for Miss Ashton, at the same time bowing deferentially to the pompous dame with the big fan. He proceeded to adjust the shawl around the dimpled shoulders, so very precious to him, and said, I hope you have had a pleasant evening, Miss Augusta. Then, bowing again to Mrs. Broadbent, he offered his hand respectfully to the young lady to conduct her home. On the instant they were intercepted by Aspinall and Wormsley, neither so sober as he might have been. Augusta, here's my friend Aspinall, juice good fellow, quite struck with you, was Captain Wormsley's unceremonious introduction, at a time, too, when introductions were somewhat formal. Quite, Miss Ashton, he assented. Pon my soul I am. Your charming face has quite captivated me, and those eyes pierce my heart like bullets. Permit me to escort you home. There was an amusing consciousness of his own attractions in this free expression of his admiration. A woman of the world, with her weapons ready, might have dismissed him either with hauteur, badinage, or cool indifference. But to August Rashton, almost a child in years, it was bewildering and disconcerting. Her eyes fell, a colour rose. She stood silent, abashed and confused. Native modesty too calm. Jabez came to her relief. Miss Ashton is under my protection, sir. She requires no other escort. The words were cool as those of a man who, having his temper well under control, did not choose to quarrel though his pulses were beating like drums. With cool effrontery, his old antagonist looked him full in the face. So it's you again, yellow skirt. A nice fellow to protect a pretty girl. A fellow without skill to defend himself, or spirit to resent an insult, and the speaker's red lips curled with derision. The eyes of Jabez kindled and his teeth set. There was no lack of spirit, but not the spirit of which common brawls are made. He was anxious to get the trembling Augusta away from the gathering crowd. Madame Broadbent, shorn of a half her pretty train, came up aghast. Young lady, Miss Ashton, what is? A wave of the silver braided sleeve set her aside, chafe and indignant, at the freedom and impertinence. Keep out of the way, Mother Broadbent, Look after the rest of your lambkins. Miss Ashton's cousin and I propose to see your pupil home. All right, Augusta, said Wormsley thickly. We'll see you home. But she clung in dismay to the arm of Jabus, and not Hercules himself could have torn her from him. Ignoring the coarse taunt of Lieutenant Aspinall, he endeavoured to lead her past them, simply saying to Captain Wormsley, Mr. Ashton committed his daughter to my care. I am answerable for her safety. Aspinall, mistaking his calmness for pusillanimity, again intercepted their passage, and would have taken Augusta's hand, but a will strong as his own, 
an arm strengthened by lifting and carrying heavy burdens, was opposed to him. Jabez struck no blow. He thrust out an arm with muscles like leather, swept the offensive lieutenant aside, and down he went on the stone pavement of the lobby. Bravo, Clegg, exclaimed a voice from the rear, and the burly form of Ben Travis parted the curious crowd as Levithian parts the waves. Before the infuriated Aspinall could rise, or warmly interpose. That's right, take the young lady away, and leave these gallant books to me. I'll guard the honour of our corps. The terrified young lady and the inebriated young bully were alike in sure hands, but consequential. Madame Broadbent, ignored, forgotten, had received a blow to her importance she was not likely to forget or overlook.